Hey guys, it's Trafalton. For the last six months, I've used Universal Blue, a series of Fedora images with a strong user-facing focus. On the surface, Universal Blue is no different from your standard Linux distribution. Instead, Universal Blue is about the future of desktop Linux and a glimpse of how that might be a little better. <laughs> But more than a year ago, and recently, I've chatted with George Castro, one of the lead developers of Universal Blue. And as I've said before, I've never seen something from any other project in a long time that offers this much promise. But a lot can happen in six months. So how has it been any different over the last six months of me using a different Linux flavor, so to speak? And that's what this is going to be all about. The first thing to really focus on here is that Universal Blue itself isn't really much of a distribution, as much as it really is different variants of Fedora's Atomic Desktops, which is the distribution. For example, I use Bluefin, which is the GNOME experience, but there's also Aurora, the KDE experience, and Bazite, the gaming version with both GNOME and KDE with the SteamOS-like big picture mode. Now, for the more technical users, you can also build your own using a blue built image. You're probably wondering, well, how do I get started? So if you're into GNOME, you're probably going to download Bluefin. If you're into KDE, you're probably going to download Aurora. If you're a gamer, you're going to download Bazite. If you're a nerd who wants to download the base images, we'll get to you later. <laughs> And after you pick uh, the image you want, Bluefin, Aurora, or Bazite, you can add support for specific hardware or desktops, and a ton is supported here. I'm not going to really talk about installation because installation is pretty similar to Fedora's install. What makes Bluefin more interesting is under the hood, and it's how things are handled differently. So the first thing to talk about is what the atomic nature of desktops look like. So the first is since Bluefin and Aurora are part of the Fedora Atomic Desktop family, the things that people know that are different. But a lot of the stuff that people do know is also backwards compatible. For one, your Linux system files can't be changed. Instead, your system is updated with a new system that's queued up as independent systems and then brought up the next time you reboot. So that way you're never forced to reboot when you don't want to, but when you do, you are immediately moved to the newly updated, fresh new system, but that's just as rock solid as the one you left behind. And now this is a big bugaboo for neckbeard Linux users online, but what I think is more interesting is modification within existing frameworks of Linux, despite discourse online that tells you you can't modify these images. And this idea stems from a combination of very hidden and poorly worded documentation and how Linux allows users to override developer configurable pieces of their system. If you can't configure your USR or your bin folder, how are you going to install applications? Well, it's easy. You're just going to put them in your .local bin, for example, in your home folder. If you're just going to be testing files or tar executables or whatever that you're downloading from the internet, you can just run them in your home folder and they don't need to have root privileges. I use DaVinci Resolve as my video editor of choice. So in theory, with an atomic desktop, I shouldn't be able to edit my system files. But third-party applications like DaVinci Resolve are installed in the slash opt folder. And that makes it so that Fedora Atomic lets you install in the opt folder. And whatever you install in the opt folder persists past reboots. Now, I've been talking about rebooting a lot, but reboots are a way for you to recover from a bad update or disaster, but it's also the way that you install new software onto your system. If you don't like an update, you can always force your computer off, like say if your computer froze up on you, or you can run a quick version recovery to get everything in your system back to where it was before an update was installed. So this way you will always have a working and bootable system. A criticism that I and many developers have levied on the so-called stable distributions of Linux is that these stable distributions aren't even that safer when it comes to protecting their users from bad updates. Because using this kind of rollback on reboot is a way of having your cake and eating it too. You get to keep a highly updated rolling package base, but you also have the peace of mind that you always have a working system no matter what, even if it's one or two reboots away. With that in mind, if we can't make changes to the root file system, that means installing packages must be at least a little bit different. 
So if Fedora Atomic and Universal Blue are different, how are you going to install things? The primary means of how you get applications is through flat packs. Now, the vast majority of graphical software that people use are going to be gotten through flat packs. And there are multiple ways to get flat packs. So for example, you can use GNOME software, but you can also use the pre-installed program warehouse, which allows you to graphically interact with flat pack data install flat packs, but also take snapshots of specific application versions. There's also programs like BoxBuddy for graphically interacting with DistroBox, which is a way for you to install a program from any Linux distribution, provided it doesn't require a horrible amount of system access. <laughs> BoxBuddy provides a graphical way to update and install programs within these containers so you can do more with your system than you could if you were only using Fedora. So for example, using downloading a program like LF, the file manager, is very difficult. But if you install LF in a DistroBox container, like say an Arch or OpenSUSE DistroBox container, you can use LF and integrate it into your system as if it was always part of your system and installed natively. And it's separate from your system in a container so it doesn't mess up any of your files inside. Now for GNOME extensions, Matthew Jakeman's extension manager is pre-installed, which allows you to install GNOME extensions without a browser extension. And it lets you toggle existing extensions and tweak their settings. <laughs> and finally, although it's my least favorite, is if you have programs that are app images, they'll work just fine <laughs> because app images are another portable method to install specific software that you need, albeit being messier to update and increased application size. Now, this all sounds like a lot, but what if you can't use any of these? And I think this is where to remember something like a Fedora Atomic will give you an avenue of reverting back to the old school Fedora way of doing things. But in order to install things the old Fedora way, the commands are a little different. Like for example, instead of using sudo apt install or sudo dnf install, you just do a rpm os tree install instead or an rpm os tree remove instead of an apt remove or dnf remove but in order to get these applications or the removals that you want to take place you will need to reboot your system first now a lot of people get upset by the rebooting business but if you're really annoyed by this i think a question you should ask yourself is why in the world are you watching yourself install things or update things there's probably something more productive you could be doing even if it's just sitting down and watching the movie of choice in your web browser <laughs> and finally if there's settings that you'd like to change, there's additional customization available in UJust for some specialty applications. So for example, if you're running an AMD GPU, you can install DaVinci Resolve in a DistroBox container. You can also install uh, Olama if you want to use any AI models, and tweaking various settings across your system like NVIDIA Optimus, Secure Boot via TPM, etc. <laughs> Now one of the best parts about Universal Blue is installing updates. You don't have to do anything. <laughs> All updates are queued and staged automatically in the background. You don't have to click any buttons. You don't have to click I agree to some end user license agreement you probably already agreed when you installed the thing to begin with. It all just happens without any interaction whatsoever. Now, people like to say that, oh, but if new people should be using Ubuntu or Linux Mint or Fedora because they make it easier for the people because that's what people have always been using. But do you want to know what Ubuntu, Linux Mint, and Fedora don't do? Is they don't make updating between specific versions of their operating system seamless. But now it's time for the butts. Because what if you don't like something that's part of the universal blue image that you installed? What if you tried to remove something from the base image? You actually can, but there's a catch. And that's where the time for the people who wanted to build their base images showed up. And now I'm going to disappoint you by telling you I did not actually learn how to do this myself. But I'll explain to you why I didn't learn how to do this myself. And it will become very apparent very quickly. <laughs> So what you do first is you get one of the base universal blue images. And this is actually just a base 
Fedora Silver Blue, or Fedora Kino White, or Fedora Saracia, and you pick one that you like the best, and which is a completely bare bones installation of the mainline Fedora images. Well, layering means you edit a file which basically records all the changes that you are making. And then when the new version of your image is built, it's built with these changes in mind. So for example, let's take the base Bluefin image or the base Fedora Silver Blue image, for example. And let's say you don't want GNOME Text Editor because you use something like, I don't, I don't know, Vim or Nano. You can run a command when the image is built to remove GNOME Text Editor so that it's not pre-installed. Once you have all of your changes in place, you've even installed files to copy into your image, let's say for configuration, you can build your image on your Git server, like a GitHub, GitLab, or HomeLab if you're choosing. <laughs> this way, you can configure your Git server to build your image daily, or however long you need to do when you check your for updates, for example. And now this is where I think the biggest problem is, because me describing all of this, you probably had your eyes glaze over or fall asleep because you're like, what the heck did he just say? That That is my, pro my point. <laughs> The problem is desktop Linux development is very niche and being able to remove an application like GNOME Text Editor is about as important as installing one and needs to be done in a way that requires zero human interaction with Git. And I cannot stress that enough that if you require any single human interaction of Git, I cannot, I will not use your program. That is just stupid. The fact of the matter is Entering in something like sudo apt remove is objectively easier than trying to maintain and construct flavoring for your entire operating system. And this is going to be a big barrier for the people who want to do this sort of thing. What's more is you will see the actual people leading projects very similar to this. Like for example, Adrian Voke of Grenome, who's now stoking for the fire of dropping all support for any form of Linux packaging that isn't a universal package or container. Now to be fair to developers like Adrian, who are actively working in these spaces, they deserve the right to make these decisions and changes. And I think the problem isn't so much moving in this direction. It's only inevitable that the Linux desktop is going to move in this direction and it's going to, in a way, unify the Linux desktop with what's going on with Linux on the server. The problem isn't so much the process as much as it is the companies who have to use Linux and the so whose users use their software on Linux. It's taken years for companies like Zoom to support Wayland, and for programs like TeamViewer, which are very slow to adopt Wayland support. Now, for sure, there's going to be growing pains because it's only early days, but when it comes to massively popular commercial software, getting rid of avenues to install it is nowhere near ready anytime soon. Have you ever wondered why Molivad VPN isn't a flat pack? The reason it isn't a flat pack is because Mulvad needs to install a service that runs on boot, which prevents any IP address leakage on your Linux system. Let's say you want to access storage devices, for example, or the, and the program isn't quite up to date for the task. I'm going to throw Veracrypt under the bus, for example, because the way it mounts to, and formats devices uh, it can't be done using a flat pack. Well, it can be. It's more like Veracrypt needs to be rewritten, and Veracrypt is a licensing nightmare that won't be able to make it to be rewritten. I think despite uh, these criticisms of not being able to remove packages, the difficulties of building your own image, or even the minor learning curve of being slightly different than what most Linux users know, I don't think it's a lot to ask for, and I believe Universal Blue right now is a good combination of staying true to the ideals of its developers and offering a fantastic stable base to its users. And I think that's a solid experience. And it's so solid, in fact, it is now going to become my go-to recommendation for everybody using Linux, provided you can deal with some limitations or specific types of software. Now, I will be working with my own friends and family across the holiday season and beyond about what to do for the future. 
Right now, I think the only people who shouldn't be using Universal Blue are A, for the people who need to use snap packages because they don't work, and B, for the people who live in storage constraints computers or Chromebooks because they don't have enough memory to handle taking another snapshot of an image like Universal Blue does. But it's also something that may not be too far off from the future, because just because Universal Blue can't do it doesn't mean someone could construct a system that could be done this way either. But it's all about supply and demand, and all that stuff's a ways away. And today, I can proudly recommend Universal Blue to you, as long as you can get around the limitation of not being able to edit your image, at least easily. If you're willing to delve into the joys of maintaining your own GitLab instance or whatever, you do you, man. It's just not me. I don't got the time. I barely have time to do anything on YouTube. But do you want to know what you've got the time to do? You've got time to go down below and click the like button. Hit that like button if you want to see me rebase my computer and try out Bazite, the one universal blue image I have not tried yet. Also, if you are interested, there is an entire transcript of my review on my website in the description, trafotin.com, T-R-A-F-O-T-I-N.com, and you can read the, this as an article instead of watching the video, for example. Or, if you just want to have the links to any of the sources that I use to pull any of my information, you can also check them out there. As, as always, the work that I do is supported by the people who donate me money. I am very sorry for the lack of updates because the holiday season has just been crazy for me, but I'd like to thank all of you who have been giving very graciously to me and for the people that I've met along the way to make this journey possible. With that, thank you guys for watching. I will see you guys next time, and I'm just going to go enjoy rebasing my system on Bazite to see if it's any better. <laughs>